Hi guys, I'm Ahmed Farah from Fin Study Club. I'll take you through some important areas in fixed income security CFA level 1. These concepts do get very often tested in the exam. Let's look at how do we go about arriving at the value and YTM of a bond. So here we have an illustration. The one year spot rate is 3% and the forward rate stated with an annual periodicity of 1 for years. 1, 2, 3, 1 year from now are 4%, 5% and 6% respectively. Using this information, calculate the YTM of a bond that pays an annual coupon of 7% and has a remaining term of 3 years. So here we have a 3 year bond. We've been given the 1 year spot rate and the 1 year forward rate 1 year from now, 2 years from now and 3 years from now. So let's set up the timeline. All this helps. So here we have year 1, year 2, year 3. We might as well stop here given that it's a 3 year bond. The 1 year spot rate has been given as 3%. The 1 year forward rate 1 year from now is 4%. So there we have it. This is 5%. So these are forward rates. Okay. Uh, my cash flows would be with respect to a 7% 3 year bond would be $7, $7 and $107 assuming that it's a $100 face value bond. I need to arrive at the present value of these cash flows, add them up to arrive at the value of the bond. This 7 would get discounted by 3%. Now this $7 is 2 years away so I'm going to discount it consecutively with 3% and 4% so 1.03 into 1.04 and this 107 would get discounted by 3%, 4% and 5% so and then we add it up to arrive at the value of the bond. Since we are on this question we can very quickly have a sense of what would be the 2 year spot rate. 3% plus 4% divided by 2, 3.5% would be the 2 year spot rate approximately so. The 3 year spot rate is going to be 3 plus 4 plus 5 which is 9 plus 3, 12, 12 divided by 3 gives me 4%. So I realize that the 1 year spot rate is 3%, the 2 year spot rate approximately is 3.5%, the 3 year spot rate is 4%. Now given that it's a 3 year bond with a 7% coupon, not very low coupon but at the same time not really very heavy. I would get a sense that the YTM of this bond is going to be some sort of a weighted average of these three with of course 4% playing a much greater role because the substantive portion of the cash flow happens at year 3. So 4% will have a greater role, a greater say in the YTM. So my weighted average YTM is going to be near 4% but it's going to be less than 4% given that the spot rates uh, for uh, your for one year for two years are lower than the three year spot rate so my weighted average is going to be around 3.9 3.8 percent and we just have one answer in line with it so we know that the answer is going to be one now that's 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 a quick smart way of arriving at the YTM though I would not really suggest that that's how you should go for in the exam in the exam I think you should just go by the by the tested approach which is I arrive at the value of the bond so let me do that so we get a value which is 108.46. So what you do is now you put your calculator to use. You say that the PV is 108.46. You have a negative sign. Your FV is 100. Your PMT is 7. N is 3. And then you compute I by Y. And you get an answer which is going to be around 3.95%. Okay. We move on to the next one. An investor is considering buying one of two bonds issued by a company. The bonds are identical in all respects except that one bond is a floating rate note and the other is a fixed rate coupon bond. So once one is a floater, the other is a fixed rate bond. In comparing the two securities, the investor most likely should understand that relative to the fixed rate bond, the floating rate note should have equal interest rate risk, lower interest rate risk and so on. So in terms of interest rate risk, we all understand interest rate risk, right? Because that's the dominant risk that I'm exposed to while investing in bonds. Isn't it? A bond price is going to be very sensitive to the movement in interest rates. If interest rates go down, bond prices would go up. 
that's what we understand. Uh, a floater is much less sensitive to the movements uh, in interest rate than a fixed rate bond. In other words, a floater will have a lower interest rate risk and that's very easy to understand given that the coupon of a floater is aligned with interest rates. Okay, so the answer is going to be between the second and third. Let's just go through the second and the third uh, 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 options in entirety lower interest rate risk but its market price can still vary significantly from par so can the floaters the floating rate bond price significantly vary from par or is it going to be close to par at all times well while the interest rate risk of a floater is going to be lower than that of the fixed rate bond it does not imply that the price of the floater will remain more or less stable that means near par there could be good reasons for the floater to trade at a discount to par or at a premium to par on account of the change in credit quality. So if the credit quality of the floater improves, uh, there would be a rise in price. And if uh, the credit quality of the floater goes down, there would be a decline in price. So credit, credit quality, in other words, credit risk as well would play a role. So we would go for option B. Let's now come to the third one. Here we are going to talk about the concept of clean price and dirty price. I hope all of you remember. Uh, dirty price, also known as the full price. And your clean price is also known as the flat price. So here you have an 8% coupon bond which makes semi-annual coupon payments. There are two further coupons to be paid and the bond matures at $100 in 273 days. So we basically have a one and a half period left because this is one period which is of 182 days and then you have another 91 days left from 182 days. So all in all 273 days. You're going to get a coupon over here and here and of course the redemption happens over here. Uh, the, the, the YTM is 6% while the coupon of this bond is 8%. So your semi-annual coupon is going to be four dollars so four one zero four are going to be my cash flows my YTM is six percent now that's for the entire year and since the period out here is semi-annual so the effective YTM is going to be three percent so I'm going to discount it at three percent now given that this is half a period so four dollars is just half a period away I'm going to take it as 0 0.5 raised to the power 0 0.5 and this is going to be 1.03 raised to the power 1.5 because 104 is one and a half periods away where one period is equal to 182 days to keep in mind okay now this when added together would give me the 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 full price of the bond so that's essentially the fair price of the bond so let's calculate this so this gives me 103.42 so I know that the full price of the bond is 103.42 let's now look at how do we go about computing the the, the the clean price or the flat price so the clean price also known as the flat price is equal to dirty price also known as the full price minus the accrued interest now the accrued interest is that portion of coupon which has accrued but has not yet been paid. Now think of it guys, the four dollars that, that that an investor gets here is for this 182 days. This portion, this portion has already lapsed. So half of this four dollars is for a period which has already lapsed so that's the accrued portion of the coupon so half of four is two dollars okay so when I knock off two dollars from 103.42 it gives me what is known as the clean price okay so that's the relationship between clean price and dirty price and how do we go about computing these two let's now move on look at uh, a question which covers I spread, Z spread and G spread. So just a good excuse for me to bring in a discussion, a quick discussion on I spread, Z spread and G spread. Which, of, which one of the following spreads is based on the entire benchmark spot curve? Let's understand the concept of spread. Now, guys, do remember 
a lot many times we deal with corporate bonds which are risky and I would want to get a sense of the kind of risk premium that this corporate bond has. Uh, a good way to do this is to compare it, to compare the yield of a corporate bond with the yield of a comparable treasury bond. So let's say this is a five year bond. I take a bond, T bond, which has a maturity of five years. I look at the YTM. So let's say the YTM of this bond is 4%, while the YTM of the corporate bond is 7%. So the gap between 7% and 4% percent gives me a sense of the risk premium now this spread is known as G spread the G spread is when I compare the yield of a corporate bond with the yield of, with, the, with the yield of a comparable T bond and get the difference between the two so this clearly does not take into account the entire spot curve as remember the entire benchmark spot curve is when I take s1 s2 s3 s4 so the entire set of spot rates here we have essentially taken up the YTM of a comparable bond okay so G spread definitely does not uh, answer or it does not really qualify to be the correct option for this question I spread is very similar to G spread it's just that instead of T bond being the benchmark I'm going to take the swap interest rates as the benchmark so if I have a five-year corporate bond I'm going to look at the swap rate for a five-year swap and compare their yields and get the difference between the two that's I spread Coming over to Z spread, Z spread is the extra premium that the bond commands vis-a-vis -vis the series of spot rates uh, which would be applicable for the cash flows of this corporate bond. Okay, so which means, for instance, if I were to go back and take the three-year 7% coupon bond, which let's say is a risky bond, then this is how the cash flows of this bond were to look like. Now, how do, now remember guys, this is a corporate bond, so I can arrive at the value of this bond uh, by discounting it with the spot rate. The answer is no, because when I discount it with, it with the treasury spot rate, I'm going to get a price which is going to be much higher than the fair price of this bond, right? Because this is a risky bond. So you say, hey, I need to add some spread to it. So let's call it K, 1 plus S1 plus K. This 7 should get discounted by 1 plus S2 plus K square. And this 107 should get discounted by 1 plus S3 plus K cubed. Right? And then we add it up and try to arrive at the fair value of this bond. So the K is the known year. We try and plug in that value of K, which ensures that the, the value that we get over here is in line with the price of the bond. This K is known as the Z spread. And the Z spread that we get is based on the entire series of spot rates, so the entire benchmark spot curve. So that answers our question, Z spread. So zero vol volatility spread. Moving on, let's look at uh, a question which comes from uh, the concept of securitization. We all understand that uh, instruments like MBS, um, CMOs, ABS, and all, all, all these kind of instruments would uh, would involve some sort of prepayment risk. There's always a possibility that uh, a borrower pays back uh, uh, earlier than scheduled or later than scheduled. Or may I put it in a slightly better way? There is some sort of there is some sort of an expected prepayment that is built in okay while we try to design the various securitized instruments but then the actual prepayment speed could be very different from the expected prepayment speed so if the actual prepayment speed is lower than the expected prepayment speed that's when there could be extension risk right because the the investors on in, into these securitized instruments get their cash flows later than what was expected and if the actual prepayment speed is better than the expected prepayment risk then the cash flows come to the investors earlier than expected and that's known as contraction risk okay so as an investor into an MBS for instance I would be exposed to both now CMO which is collateralized mortgage obligations are again instruments which are based on an underlying which could be let's say an MBS okay so 
one would like to believe that a CMO as well could be exposed to some of these risks. Now there would be two types of CMO which would be of interest to us. One is the sequential pay and the other is the pack CMOs. Guys remember sequential pay I have CMOs which are which are, which are essentially broken up into various tranches. So let's say a simple example. We have two tranche, tranche one, tranche two, and tranche one would be exposed to contraction risk because it gets paid off earlier. It has a shorter maturity, while tranche two would be exposed to extension risk. So you would have the prepayment risk getting redistributed. The prepayment risk which is there in MBS gets redistributed by way of the design of the CMO tranche 1 exposed to more of uh, uh, contraction risk while tranche 2 would be exposed to more of extension risk. In the case of PAC, you have a structure for the underlying MBS. With the underlying MBS, you have a structure of a CMO where you have a PAC tranche and you have a large support tranche. The support tranche is there to, uh, to absorb all risks, be it contraction or extension, thereby uh, making the pack tranche relatively more immune to contraction as well as extension risk. So to answer this question, the support tranche carries more of which of the following risks? One would say both contraction and extension. Unlike sequential pay, where you would see the tranche with shorter maturities having more of contraction risk while the later tranches would have more of extension risk in the case of PAC you would have the support tranche which would have exposure to both the risks while the PAC tranche would be uh, relatively uh, immune to both types of risk. So that's a little about prepayment risk now we move on and uh, take another question which is based on interest rate risk an analyst has gathered the following information on three bonds which pays its coupon annually and here you have these three bonds which bond will most likely exhibit the greatest percentage price change if the market discount rate for all three bonds increased by 500 basis points so essentially what we are trying to figure out is which of these three bonds would be most sensitive to interest rate changes in other words we are looking at the interest rate risk of these three bonds. Let's do remember your interest rate risk. If we were to figure it out by the characteristics that the bond has, by the features that the bond has, remember the interest rate risk is going to be greater if the maturity is greater. For a longer maturity bond, it is supposed to have greater interest rate risk. If the coupon is greater, that's when the interest rate risk is going to be lower okay and talking about yields if the yield the YTM of the bond is greater well the risk of the interest rate risk of the bond would go down so that's how interest rate risk will map with these three features so here we have these three bonds clearly bond A has the highest maturity so if I compare A and B, both have the same coupon while bond A has a greater maturity. So clearly in terms of interest rate risk, A's interest rate risk is greater than that of B. Now if I look at B and C, they have the same maturity while the coupon of C is greater than that of B. So the interest rate risk of B is greater than that of C. So that's how the three would, uh, would, would, would stand against each other in terms of interest rate risk. So we would like to believe bond A will be most sensitive to interest rate changes. Okay, and do remember guys, your interest rate risk does get measured by way of duration. And I hope all of you remember or do know how to compute duration. So that's again something which is extremely important. Okay, so that was just a quick overview of some of the testable areas in fixed income securities, as you would realize. It carries quite a pretty decent weightage in the exam and I wish you all the best uh, as far as this section is concerned uh, as well as uh, uh, as well as the overall exam so there we there we are best wishes from the FSC team thank you very much